Welcome to the Victor Emanuel Nature Tours webinar. I am Ben Reynolds, producer and host of the Vent webinar series. Thanks for joining us today. We are delighted to offer this educational presentation about birds, nature, and vent tours. We hope you enjoy today's topic on snow leopards of Mongolia, birds and rare mammals of the Mongolian wilderness with Rafael Galvez. He is joining us live from Tucson, Arizona. Welcome, Rafael. Hey, everybody. Hello. How are you? Thank you for joining us. Vin is thrilled to offer a wonderful opportunity to see the amazing snow leopards. Partnering with EcoTours Wildlife Holidays, we offer a wilderness-style experience amid the foothills of the Altai Mountains in western Mongolia. EcoTours pioneered snow leopard tours in Mongolia, and its record of success exceeds 80%. The itinerary for this departure can be found and downloaded in the handout section in the toolbar. Also note, we will have a live question and answer session after the presentation. Now back to our feature presentation. We would like to welcome Rafael Galvez, a Renaissance man in so many ways. Thank you for presenting today on the Snow Leopards of Mongolia. We hope you enjoy this webinar. And without further ado, we will turn to Raphael's presentation. Thank you so much, Ben, for introducing me and to speaking so eloquently about this offering, Snow Leopards of Mongolia. Uh, without saying much uh, introductory material, I'm just gonna jump into it. I'm gonna turn off my camera and um, I will Turn it back on when we have the Q&A at the end of the presentation. So uh, let's get into it. So once again, thank you all so, so very much for joining us today. Um, as Ben mentioned, I'll be presenting about Snow Leopards of Mongolia in support of the upcoming tour taking place this September 1st through the 15th of 2022. The same dates will be uh, for the 2023 tour period. So uh, we have uh, two tours that we're offering for Mongolia at the time. And there are still some slots open for the 2022 September date. So please don't hesitate to sign up. At the end of the webinar, I'll have a slide with contact information for the tour operator for Snow Leopards of Mongolia, with phone number, email address, and also my personal contact information if you have any questions. So as stated before, this tour is in collaboration with EcoTours Wildlife Holidays, and I co-lead this tour with Attila Steiner. This is one of my favorite tours ever. The thrill of traveling to Mongolia alone is intriguing and, and so much fun. There have uh, naturally been some concerns from friends and clients about traveling to Mongolia because of the Russian invasion in Ukraine. And I would like to address this first. And I'm not going to spend too much time on it. Uh, Mongolia is an independent nation that has not been in conflict with Russia and retains a neutral relationship with that federation, which, it's, which is its neighbor to the north. And that should be stated. Both Attila and I have led this tour before. We have traveled extensively through the region and the post-Soviet world. We have strong local partners and operators in Mongolia that will work with us and have worked with us to ensure that this tour is conducted in a safe and successful manner. And later I'll show you a slide to show you how far away Mongolia is from the conflicts taking place right now. So that being said, again, this tour is one of my favorites ever. Just traveling to Mongolia sparks up my imagination. Throughout our lives, we have created ideas about Mongolia, having heard of Chinggis Khan, and I'll pronounce it Chinggis because that's the way the Mongolians pronounce it, and his nomadic hordes 
setting out for Mongolia and conquering the steppes across Eurasia. Chinggis Khan was the founder of the Mongol Empire, which he ruled during the first quarter of the 13th century uh, after unifying the Mongol tribes. Mongolia connotes vastness and remoteness. The country is three times the size of Texas or twice the size of the Republic of India. However, the population of India is 1.3 billion people, of Texas 28 million, while Mongolia is only 3.2 million. Gives you a sense of size versus population. Some of us have heard of the traditions of the Mongolian people, their horse riding abilities, the hauntingly beautiful throat singing tradition of the Mongolian people, their food, and much more. Mongolia also holds the second largest population of snow leopards after China. While many flock to the Himalayas in search of the species, places like Ladakh in India, Western Mongolia offers much easier access to viewing sites for snow leopards. Uh, allowing opportunities to see this elusive and endangered, magnificent cat at altitudes ranging from 6,000 to 12,000 feet in elevation, uh, while the species is rarely found below 10,000 feet in the Himalayas. So that gives you a sense of uh, why Mongolia is a favorable place to look for snow leopards. I have to stress now that this tour is not by any means an extreme tour in terms of the physical demands required to participate. Most of the wildlife viewing in this tour takes place in close proximity to our all-terrain vehicles, which we will be using to access these remote locations. We do not go scampering on rocky ledges chasing after leopards, but we use well-known safe outlook points that are accessible using our vehicles and do very short treks, uh, rarely uphill to, to, to these viewing points. Our, our partners in Ecotours Wildlife Holidays, as Ben said, pioneered snow leopard tours in Mongolia. And I will repeat what Ben said at the beginning, the record of success is 80% with this tour. And in the past, we have seen snow leopards, spectacular views for lengthy periods of time. So while our primary focus in this tour is undoubtedly the snow leopard, this tour is by no means limited to that species. And we'll go back to snow leopards in a little while. During this tour, we see a number of Asian specialty bird species, including Mongolian ground jay, white-naped crane, lammergeier, Altai snowcock, Mongolian finch, saker falcon, and many, many other exciting bird species that are difficult to find elsewhere, but quite easy to encounter in Mongolia. It is also an exciting tour for mammals in general, in past tours, we have seen more than two dozen mammal species, including Mongolian and goitered gazelles, Argali sheep, Siberian ibex, the legendary Chevalsky's horse, the highly endangered Saiga antelope, and, and a lot more. It is also an excellent tour for, small, for smaller mammal species, uh, such as pikas, uh, marmots, voles, gerbils, gerboas, especially around the camp where we stay in northwestern Mongolia, these smaller mammals abound. It's a great place to have excellent encounters with these species. So where is Mongolia? I'm sure everybody here knows, but just to reiterate, uh, Mongolia is an independent country in East Asia, bordered to the south by China, and to the north by the Russian Far East, or Siberia. 
Confusion sometimes stems from the term Inner Mongolia, which you may have heard, which is a so-called region within China immediately north of the independent Mongolian Republic. Three mountain ranges converge in Mongolia, the most prominent of which is the Altai Range, which we will visit. So there it is, Mongolia in red. And um, I've put here a little arrow to show the distance between Mongolia and the conflicts now taking place in Europe. It is roughly 5,000 kilometers away from Ukraine and from Moscow, more than the width of the contiguous continental United States. So these conflicts are occurring quite, quite far from where we will be, in case you're wondering. So what I will do is go through the itinerary of this tour and show you the highlights of each of the locations. At the end of the webinar, we can answer any questions you have about any of these locations. The itinerary that I will sort of run through brief, briefly during this webinar is a little bit different than the one that is on the website, primarily in the order in which the locations are visited. All of the originally planned sites will be visited. There's just been some adjustments made uh, with uh, the date and time and the era that we're living in. But in essence, the itinerary remains the same. So the red squares that you see here indicate the locations where we will stay overnight. The tour starts in Ulaanbaatar, which is the capital of Mongolia. There are many options to, for flying to Ulaanbaatar, either via Seoul with Korean Air, uh, a number of airlines offer options through Frankfurt or through Tokyo in case you do not want to fly through China or Russia. Ulaanbaatar is the uh, most populous city in Mongolia. It is about 4,500 feet in elevation in the Tul River. About 1.5 million people reside in Mongolia. Uh, the, it, it is a really interesting city that is quickly exploding with development and new excitement. The city offers excellent opportunities uh, for cultural visits to several museums for the arts, for anthropology, paleontology, culture in general. So we typically advise folks to get there one or two days in anticipation to rest after the flight. It's a long flight to acclimate to the jet lag and to have some free time to explore the capital from a cultural perspective. From Ulaanbaatar, we immediately go out to explore the mountains on the outskirts of the capital in search for one of the key species of this tour. down into the Manul Mountains, which is the charismatic Manul, or Palace Scat. As is the case with the snow leopard, the Palace Scat is a centerpiece of this tour. Now, this is a wildcat species of rocky mountain grasslands of Northern Asia. It is only a little bit larger than a domestic cat, differing primarily in having rounded pupils like the larger cats, rather than vertical slits like a domestic cat. And by having rounded ears that are set far apart on the sides of its head, all these aid to giving it a particular appearance. It is said to be the most expressive cat species in the world. You be the judge. It has a very dense coat, giving it often a very fluffy appearance. And it inhabits rocky crevices and burrows in remote parts of the world, like Mongolia, where it hunts for lagomorphs and rodents. If you do a quick internet search for Manul or Palaces cat, you will soon see what people mean with it being the most expressive cat species. It really 
has some very interesting expressions that are almost comical. In that region, we will also have opportunity for seeing uh, some great bird species uh, and some awesome mammals like the uh, Argali sheep and plenty of other species. Birds can range from Mongolian lark, uh, Pear David snowfinch, Dorian partridge, chukar, and so on. So it's a fantastic part of the world to visit for wildlife in general. We have also seen in this part of Mongolia, large numbers of migratory birds, uh, plenty of warbler species, and nearly a dozen species of, of buntings, including palaces bunting, yellow-breasted, pine bunting, gray-necked, so on and so forth. So it's a lot of fun to see all these buntings that are akin to our sparrows migrating through the region may appear barren, but every little bush that you find at that time of the year will have a surprising number of migratory birds. So after a couple of days of exploring the mountains near the capital, we will return to Ulaanbaatar and take a domestic flight to the primary destination for this tour, where we will spend most of our time at Hoft including six nights at an Altai Ger camp. Located in the remote northwest corner of Mongolia, Hoft is a land of vast stepped valleys surrounded by giant mountains of the Altai range, uh, of the Altai range and um, endless stretches of steppe and desert. This is the realm of the snow leopard. From here, it is also the location where we will find the bulk of the specialty bird species that make up this tour, including many raptor species such as uh, Cinereus vulture, Lammergeier, and Saker falcon. Um, and of course, the snow leopard. So um, we will make from Hoft, from our Altai Gare camp in Hoft, several excursions to selected output points to search for the for the snow leopard. We are giving ourselves five full days up there to find this elusive predator. A local team of scouts and conservationists will already be there uh, prior to our arrival, keeping an eye on the movement of known leopards within their territories. In 2019, which is the last time that we did this tour, we found a snow leopard on the first day arriving to Hoft. And we spent hours viewing it as it rested on an outcrop, then stood up, stretched, scratched itself, sniffed, then it would coil up. It was like a giant domestic cat, just docile and relaxed. It was an amazing experience. And in prior tours, multiple cats have been seen. So the snow leopard is stocky, short-legged, compared to other cat uh, species in the genus Panthera, to which it belongs. And I want you to notice those tremendous paws and that tremendously long tail. The tail is as long as the cat itself. The snow leopard has several adaptations for living in this cold and mountainous environment. Uh, it has small rounded ears to help minimize heat loss. Its large paws distribute the weight of its body in a way that it allows it to walk on snow, um, and, and the paws have fur on their undersides to increase grip on, on these steep and unstable surfaces where it hunts. It, the, the fur also on, on the bottom of its paws also help minimize heat loss. That long flexible tail 
is there to maintain a balance in the rocky terrain. The tail is very thick due to fat storage and is covered with a very thick layer of fur. So these cats use that tail as a blanket, if you may, to protect uh, especially the face when they're sleeping as they coil up. Snow leopards are vulnerable um, and, and endangered, extirpated in some parts of their range. Uh, the global population is estimated at fewer than 10,000 individuals. And unfortunately, it's expected to decline by 15% in, in the following decade. But that does not seem to be the case in Mongolia. The population, particularly in northwestern Mongolia, seems to be stable. And it is a fantastic place to look for snow leopards. So from the very small Khof city, when we land by plane from Ulaanbaatar, we set out on road to our Gare camp. And the roads will look like this, barely discernible from the barren surroundings with magnificent views in the distance. We will be staying in Gare camps uh, the camp where we will be staying is in a wonderfully evocative region at the foot of the Altai range. N now, um, you may not see the camp in this photo. It's that little line of white dots in the center. The next slide kind of zooms in. There you go. Um, and here is a camp from a different view with the step in the distance and the Altai range behind. Um, this area is well in path for main, many migratory birds. Uh, and, and there is a lot of fantastic birding to do simply from after opening the door every morning from your from uh, of your gear. Um, here's a different view of our camp from 2019. And if you're not familiar with gares, they're basically what people call yurts. The, the word yurt comes from the Russian yurta. Gare is the Mongolian word. Um, they are spacious. Um, they do have doors. Um, some of the doors are beautifully decorated with traditional designs. These gears are also equipped with actual beds with mattresses and pillows and a functioning sink. Um, the toilets and showers are in a separate structure located on one side of the camp. And there's also a restaurant gear where we have our meetings and have our meals and so forth. Because we are in a very, very remote part of the world, you will notice no other habitations in these photos. There is no electric infrastructure here. So the camp is equipped with a generator that provides a few electric outlets to each of the tents uh, for a couple of hours in the morning and also for a longer period in the evenings. The, the gears are comfortable, spacious, warm, and evocative. Um, in the past, maybe go back to this slide a little bit. Um, just walking outside, like I mentioned earlier, I, I remember in 2019, several mornings waking up because hearing the fluttering of wings on the outside of the gear itself and opening the door to discover countless weed ears of four different species everywhere on top of the gears, outside the door. Uh, Pied weed ear, sabling weed ear, desert weed ear, northern weed ear, and tons of Mongolian finches and mast wagtails and so on and so forth. So it's so much fun to be in the gear. And of course, pikas are battling each other in burrows right next to your gear. So it's a lot of fun. Although it would seem as if Mongolia is overswept with barren landscapes that all look the same, it actually features a diversity of habitats and uh, <clears throat> excuse me habitats and ecotones 
that uh, come into confluence in the Hoth region, including taiga, mountain valleys, vast steppes, and sandy deserts, it is all very scenic and, and grand. And these slight differences in habitats as we cross really large tracts of territory on our four-wheel vehicles uh, provide an opportunity to find all sorts of, of animals. Uh, it is not uncommon to see herds of Bactrian camels just far out in the distance covering the range or gazelles or, or saiga antelope. The saiga is such an enigmatic animal and we will have an opportunity to see these endangered antelopes in Mongolia has some of the best populations for, for, for this beautiful creature. Or large groups of cinereous vultures in the morning waiting for the thermals to, to give them an incentive to get up in the air. Also a great place to see all kinds of raptor species, steppe and golden eagles, eastern and steppe buzzards, kites, saker falcons, so on and so forth. Um, also, as we're traveling through the region, it is really interesting to see how people live out there. It, it, it is so fascinating. As we're traveling along, we will see a lot of these obu shrines, which are, to our eye, they look like heaps of stones which are used to worship the heaven and other entities. Typically, they bear this central stake and are wrapped in various layers of tarp and colorful plastic. Uh, and some of them have piles of artifacts of, or, or wheelchairs or crutches, no doubt part of some kind of traditional practice. I don't know enough about it, but um, it is said that they may be dedicated to spirit entities that dwell in particular places such as a mountain or a river bank, or maybe even an isolated bush or a tree. And these deities may comprise various master spirits of the land or water, sky, dragon divinities, or, or maybe some shamanic ancestor. So it's really interesting to see this and just to see the gares, a lonely gare in a distant slope and, and wondering how, how it is that these people live. During our time in Western Mongolia in 2019, uh, we, we had a, a wonderful experience and, and our time in the camp, in the Altai gare camp culminated with a beautiful and moving performance by two master throat singers that came to visit us the final evening. Now you may not have heard of this, but who may is the ancient art of overtone singing, which has been known from Western Mongolia and neighbor, neighboring Tuba for centuries. <clears throat> and what is thought is that some acoustic element of the region's expansive plains against that massive thrust of the Altai range was conducive to an ethereal form of expression, which is characterized by the singer's otherworldly, and I mean otherworldly, ability to produce a whistle-like harmonic overtone while singing a guttural melody, all produced in the throat of a single individual. So it's, in a sense, multiple voices being sung at once, sort of like a gravelly rumble, like rocks under hoofs, while simultaneously doing this droning whistle, like the wind harmonizing as one. So this tradition is listed as an intangible cultural heritage of humanity by UNESCO. And I'm gonna play for you a video if, if, if 
if you'll allow me. It, it's a short video, it's four minutes of this performance that took place at our GARA camp. And I'm gonna give you a little bit of an introduction as to what's going to happen. Um, the woman that you see on the right is Solzaya Damba, and she's been turning heads in first festival circuits because this tradition is primarily been done by men. And she's one of the primary contemporary Hume singers. And, and um, she, we will see her in this video first playing a flute and then switching to a square wheel with a neck carved into the neck of a horse. This is the Morin Kur. And the man to the left is Nansal Manurdi, and he is wearing that beautiful deal robe, the red robe. And uh, he also sings and plays the Hun Tov Shur, uh, which is a two string lute with a camel hide cover. And the legend has it that it was given to the Mongolian people by a swan. So the neck is carved and painted like that of a mute swan. So before I play this video, I will ask for your patience and that whistling overtone singing you will hear done by the woman, Zolzaya, starting at around minute 245. She'll first play the flute, then she'll switch to the viol, and then you'll hear this otherworldly, simultaneous drone and singing uh, with that whistling that I was talking about. So let's get this video going. Thank you. 
All right, wow. Did you hear Solzaya doing that amazing overtone whistling? It is just otherworldly. Mongolia, I'm telling you. So moving on, our time in Hoft will culminate with visits to various large bodies of water, including Khar Us Lake, uh, presenting excellent opportunities for all kinds of interesting birds. In 2019, we saw flocks of thousands of palaces, sand grouse, Dalmatian pelicans, ducks, geese, swans, grebes, shorebirds, quite an impressive list. So after six days in Northwestern Mongolia, we will return to the capital for a brief period for one night and set out the next day to explore the Hustai National Park close to Ulaanbaatar. At Hustai, we will find gentler and greener slopes and rolling country. This is the realm of the Shavalski's horse, the sole remaining wild horse in the world. It is also known as the Tahi, or Mongolian wild horse. They are heavily built with a large head, thick neck and short legs. Uh, they're buff colored with a zebra-like erect mane. Uh, Perchewalski's horse once ranged throughout uh, Europe and Asia and the steppes of Mongolia, which represent the greatest expanse of largely unaltered grassland, are their last outhold. Um, as I mentioned before, Shavalsky's horse are the only wild horse left in the world. The so-called wild horses that we find in the North American West or East Coast Barrier Islands, or even in Australia, are actually feral domestic horses that escaped from farmlands or ranchers and have returned to the wild. The Shavalsky's horse is uh, an archetypal wild horse. And we will have ample opportunities to get beautiful close encounters with these beautiful animals. So after our time in, Hust in Hustai, we will uh, enter the last chapter of our tour, which will take us to the Gun Galut Nature Reserve. This region is composed of several large lakes, riparian valleys, creeks, and are that are wonderful places to find waterfowl, again, shorebirds, raptors, a number of regulars, such as ruddy shell duck, hooper swans, taiga bean goose, and surprises like Baikal teal, ferruginous duck, so on and so forth. But the primary reason why we visit Gun. Galut is to look for the white-naped crane. The white-naped crane is a threatened species with a breeding range limited primarily to Eastern Mongolia and parts of Eastern Siberia and China. It is important to remember that 11 of the world's 15 species of cranes are threatened with extinction. It is, to me, and to many, 
always memorable to see these graceful birds throughout the world, especially out east. Cranes are symbols of longevity, fidelity, friendship, and have captured the attention of uh, bird watchers and lay folk the world over. So on that note, we will finish the tour, return to Ulaanbaatar for our final meal and our final checklist, and fly back home. Now, before I close the webinar entirely, I've also included some uh, a slide with, with some suggestions. What's interesting about Mongolia is that up until recently, there had not been proper field guides to the country. But in the last three years, two field guides have come out. One is uh, published by the John Bufoy Publishing Company. It's called A Field Guide to the Birds of Mongolia by Gambold and Smith. And the other is called simply Birds of Mongolia, and it's available through Princeton or Helm. And it's by Sundev and Lehi. And um, they're both great guides. Uh, they're an excellent place to learn what birds we can encounter there. If you look at the itinerary that's posted on the VENT website, you will find many more resources, including uh, books about mammals, books about plants, books about culture. And I always suggest that when you go on any tour uh, from this point forward, that you look into downloading the Merlin app and downloading the pack that is pertinent to the region you'll be visiting. So in this case, you would be downloading the one for Mongolia. And it's a great way to have on your mobile device photos, range maps, and recordings of the vocalizations of all the birds that have been documented from that part of the world. So we are in a period of time when we have fantastic resources for spending uh, an excellent time viewing wildlife in Mongolia. And I hope that you will join me and Attila. Again, here is the slide with the information. Snow Leopards of Mongolia is the name of the tour. It'll be taking place September 1st through the 15th. We still have a few open slots, so please don't hesitate in signing up. Um, again, I co lead it with Attila Steiner of Ecotours Wildlife Holidays. And you can contact Greg Lopez at the vent office. Uh, Greg at ventbird.com is his uh, email. And here on the slide, you have two phone numbers where you can reach them. And with, with that, I'll finish the, uh, the webinar. We can open up to any questions. Ben? Wonderful, Rafael. That was a soul-stirring presentation. Thank you, thank you. Uh, now let's ask the audience if they would like to ask any questions. Uh, feel free to put them either in the chat or the Q&A section of your toolbar. Um, and while they're doing that, I have a question for you about the wonderful song, the Tuvan Throat Singers. Do you know what they were singing about? I, I do not know. Um, the, the, I've posted, and maybe we can do this later, Ben, is uh, uh, I, I loaded some of those videos to my personal YouTube uh, account, but maybe we can re uh, connect to the to, to the vent account and there there's one video where there's a little bit of a brief explanation but uh, uh i understood that they were poetic and a lot of them had to the typical songs about love and 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 the beautiful countryside it's what i understood but i don't know the specifics uh, that was the first time that i heard a, a female produce sounds like that that was extraordinary it, 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 it really stirs my heart every time I hear it. I, I've been a, a fan of who may singing for a long, long time. I remember hearing it as, as a child 
And it was hard for me to believe that a single individual could be doing that and at the same time be doing that whistling from the back of the throat and seeing it in person. It's just unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Uh, could you tell us about uh, the elevation gains, uh, the different heights that you will travel to? So our, our camp in the Altai region is at roughly 6,000 feet. And we start encountering the possibility for a snow leopard and snow leopard territories at around 10,000 feet. Uh, when uh, in 2019, to give you an idea, we saw snow leopards under somewhere between uh, 11,000 and, and, and 12,000 feet. We did not go any higher than that. And all of that from that 6,000 foot base camp to the place where we see the snow leopards, all of it is accessed by all-terrain vehicles that are driven by locals. They're in good shape. We use plenty of vehicles to give everybody window space. And in a sense is the vehicle stop and you step out a few yards and you're looking for the snow leopards right there and then. There's no hiking whatsoever involved from stepping out of the vehicle to the locations where we see the snow leopards. Barbara has a question. Uh, are snow leopards at all comfortable close to humans near the viewpoints? Are they less stressed perhaps with humans nearby? Well, that's 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 the interesting magic of the optics in that we are relatively close to these snow leopards and through your binoculars or through a scope or through a camera lens, they look like they're right in your face, but they are on a facing gorge wall. So it's an abyss, a literal abyss separating us. And the snow leopards are probably very aware of our proximity, but they know that they have every advantage in terms of the element in which they're in. Um, the, the local conservationists work very closely with the known snow leopards. They sort of follow them and track them at a distance to our benefit because when we arrive, we already know where the leopards are. It's more the finding the leopards really comes in to finding like where's Waldo. They are so incredibly camouflaged that in 2019, we were at one site for about an hour when someone said, oh my goodness, the leopard is right there. It had been there sleeping the whole time, but it was blending in so perfectly into the rocks. Those rosettes on their coat are perfectly like the porous shadows on the rock. It's just remarkable. So, the, so we get as close as it's proper to, to, to be to them because we're with conservationists that are working to protect these snow leopards but the snow leopards really are on the other side of the gorge and abyss away, if you understand what I'm saying. Oh uh, yeah, exactly, I can see that. I would love to see that in person actually. <laughs> um, a, a question for you about seeing them and how they camouflage themselves in the landscape. Have you tried or have you thought, considered uh, taking a thermal imaging camera? Well, that would require for us to be um, well, you know, I'll tell you, yes, that's a, a, a lot more people are using that kind of equipment these days, even for birding, believe it or not. It's sort of like a new frontier. Um, it is nothing, I'll leave it at this. It is nothing that we are contemplating for this upcoming tour because there are certain limitations. Um, however, it's an idea that has crossed many minds not only for snow leopards, but for many difficult uh, species. It, it, and, and we may be seeing more uh, easily accessible or, or affordable equipment in that realm soon. Let's see. Well, we had many uh, comments in the chat 
fantastic. Wow. Very exciting. I want to go. I want to go too. Let's uh, go. Awesome let's presentation. Yeah. So let's uh, let's all find a time in September to go. Yes, please. We still have some slots open, so don't hesitate to contact Greg. If you have more questions, please shoot me an email. I'd love to um, answer any questions. And um, let's go. Let's go to Mongolia. So it looks like that uh, wraps up our section with question and answers. But if anybody has any questions that you would like to ask later, feel free to reach out to me, ben at bentbird.com or Rafael Galvezbirds at gmail.com. Uh, we are happy to uh, continue this conversation with you and we hope to see you in the field in the near future. Yeah, thank you so much for joining and um, looking forward to seeing all of you in a future tour, hopefully Mongolia. Bye. Bye everybody.